I'll tell one little story. <laughs> one time, one of our very powerful preachers, sannyasi, was traveling and preaching, and he came here and preached in Pune many, many years ago. He actually disappeared from the planet. His name was Sridhar Swami. And he was here, and he was about, he had finished his preaching. Now he was about to leave, and he was getting ready to leave, and the devotees were saying, Maharaj, don't leave, don't leave. We really need a sannyasi here. Please stay. He said, what do you mean? You have a sannyasi. His name is Radhi Sham. I always remember that. <laughs> And I realized it wasn't just a, st a statement he made. It was, it was something that you could write about. You know, it's, it's like, you know, whatever you see here is the development of Radhi Sham's bhakti from his love for his spiritual master and his dedication to Srila Prabhupada's mission. And that is a fact. <laughs> so we... we I come here just to learn from Radhe Shyam Prabhu. <laughs> That's one of the reasons. <laughs> Hare Krishna, this is the Bhagavatam Kaksha Ka Anuvad Hindi Me, Niche Bhakti Vedanta Hall Me Hova. So, who wants to listen to Hindi, they can go to Bhakti Vedanta Hall. You can tell FM number also, FM. So. Jai Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Jai Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Gopi Janavalava Gary Vara Gopi Janavalava Gopi Janavalava Gary Vara Gopi Sour and undana, Hajadana and Hajadana Sour and undana, Hajadana and Hajadana Sour and undana, Jamuna Tira Hevan Tahim Tahira Higher Hey, <laughs> 
मौन धीरा मौन धीरा धारा माधवा पुन जबिहा Om namo bhagavate vasudevaya Om namo bhagavate vasudevaya Before I begin the class we should today today is the very holy day It's the appearance day of Lord Jesus Christ, <laughs> who, who is a great, 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 very great personality. <laughs> so we honor saints, personalities in all religious traditions because they are all serving the supreme personality of Godhead with pure devotion. <laughs> okay. Hare Krishna. Uh, this class ka FM. हिंदी में 89.7 में है हिंदी 89.7 एंड इन इंग्लिश 102 इन इंग्लिश 102 हरे कृष्ण श्री कैंटो सिक्स चैप्टर टू Ajami delivered by the Vishnu Didas Dudas 40 text 45 and then 46 45 is on the board 46 is on the board okay Natapparam karma nibandha kritanam Vamuksitam tirtha pada nukirtanat नयापुनम कर्मेशु साजते मनो राजस्थमो भ्यम कालिलम तथान यथा नतात्परम कर्मनि बंद कृतनम मुमुक्षतम तीर्था पदानु कीर्तनात नयापुनम कर्मेशु सजैत मानो राजस्थमो भ्यम कालिलम तथान यथा नतापरम कर्मनि बंद कृतनम मुमुक्षतम तीर्थ पदानु कीर्तनात नयापुनम कर्मसु सज्जते मनो राजस्थमो भ्यम कालिलम तथान
would like to try. Therefore, param, better means, karma nibanda, the obligation to suffer or undergo tribulations as a result of fruit of activities. Kvintanam, that which can completely cut off. Umukshatam, a person desiring to get out of the clutches of material bondage. Tathapada, about the Supreme Personality of Godhead, at whose feet all the holy places stand. Anukirtanat, then constantly chanting, under the direction of the bona fide spiritual master. Na, not, yet, because, puna, again, karmesu, in food of activities, sajjate, becomes attached, mana, the mind, Rajatamobhyam, by the modes of passion and ignorance, Kalilam, contaminated, Tata, thereafter, Anyata, by any other means. So I'll read verse 45 and then read verse 46. Verses 45. Ajamya was a Brahmin who, because of bad association, had given up all Brahminical culture and religious principles. Becoming most fallen, he stole, drank, and performed other abominable acts. He even kept a prostitute. Thus, he was destined to be carried away to hell by the orders carriers of Yamaraj. But he was immediately rescued simply by a glimpse of the chanting of the holy name of Narayan. Verse number 46. Therefore, one who desires freedom from material bondage should adopt the process of chanting and glorifying the name, form, fame, pastimes of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, at whose feet all holy places stand. One cannot derive the proper benefit from any other method such as pious atonement, speculative knowledge and meditation in mystic yoga, because even after following such methods, one takes to fruit of activities again. Unable to control his mind, which is contaminated by the base qualities of nature, namely passion and ignorance. Hmm. Srila Prabhupada's purport. 
It has actually been seen that even after achieving so-called perfection, many karmis, jnanis, yogis become attached to material activities again. Many so-called swamis and yogis give up material activities as faults, jagat mitya. But after some time, they nevertheless resume material activities by opening hospitals and schools, performing other activities for the benefit of the public. Sometimes they participate in politics, although still falsely declaring themselves sannyasis, members of the renounced order. The perfect conclusion, however, is that one, if one actually desires to get out of the material world, he must take to devotional service, which begins with Shravanam, Kirtanam, Vishnu, chanting and hearing the glories of the Lord. The Krishna conscious movement has proved this. In the Western countries, many young boys who were addicted to drugs and who had many other bad habits, which they could not give up, abandoned the, all those propensities and very seriously engaged in chanting the glories of the Lord as soon as they joined the Hare Krishna movement. In other words, this process is the perfect method of atonement for actions performed in the lower modes of passion and ignorance. As stated in the Bhagavad Gita 1.2.19, Tada rajastamo bhavam kamalo vastayascaye eta eta anavidham stitam sadde prasidati as a result of rajas and tamas, one becomes increasingly lusty and greedy. But when one takes to the process of chanting and hearing, one comes to the platform of goodness and becomes happy. As he advances in devotional service, all his doubts are completely eradicated. Vidyate ridayam grantis chidyate sarvasam sayaha. Thus, the knot of his desire for fruit of activities is cut to pieces. Om Vigyan Timiram Dasya Gyanam Jana Salakaya Tigurudenamaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasaya Bhutale Shimakti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Purana Deve Gaurani Pichari Evasesa Sunyavari Pasyatya Desita Panchakalpa Turu Vesha Kriva Sindhu Bevacha Pitanam Bhavani Bhyo Vaishnavi Bhyo Namahom Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sivasati Gaura Bhaktivin Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Shiva Prabhupada Ki So, this story in pastime of Ajamil is the foundation for really understanding the glories of the Lord. In fact, Bhagavatam sometimes is given the title, the story of, or the life story of Ajamil. It's given such preference in the Bhagavatam as being one of the most significant and lesson teaching stories because what is it teaching is that uh, Krishna says that, um, let's see, uh, what is that? Nam nam akari bahuda nija sarva shaktis. Nija Sarva Shaktis means that all of the power, all of the names, all of the qualities, all of the forms, all of the activities, the entire existence is in the name of the Lord. <laughs> Powerful, huh? You can't understand it simply by thinking about it. You can't intellectualize. All you can do is experience, to some degree, a little bit of that power that comes by chanting the holy names of the Lord. So the Lord's mercy, sometimes devotees ask for mercy. So here is the mercy. The mercy is to chant. And chanting brings everything to the proper understanding. The reason why we have trouble in Krishna consciousness is because we're not chanting enough. <laughs> or we're not chanting properly. 
if we just perfect our chanting, work on developing our chanting more and more, we'll find that all problems start to disappear. And the only problem you have is trying to find enough time for chanting. <laughs> That's the only problem you'll have. And as it says, satatam kirtayan tomam yutantas tastrudavritaha tutantas tastyamam nityam nitya yukta upasyate. One who chants the glories of the Lord is actually associating with the, the Lord directly. The Srimad Bhagavatam gives a very powerful and direct verse. It says, Satam prasangam mamavir yasam vido bhavanti ritkarna rasayana kata najosinata upam. What is the rest of it? Ratir Bhaktir Anukamishyati. That chanting the glories of the Lord is nectar to the ear, karna, and to the heart, rit karna. And one who engages that in the association of devotees, then bhakti begins. Bhakti actually begins when one seriously takes up the chanting or glorification of the holy name. Well, of course, we can glorify the Lord by glorifying his pastimes, his qualities, um, so many ways to glorify the Lord. But the essence of glorifying the Lord is to chant the holy names. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare. And sometimes we meet people who think, well, they have this, uh, what we say, partial misunderstanding, which is based on the idea that all the activities in devotional service are absolute. And it's correct, they are. But Lord Chaitanya has given special emphasis on the glorification of his name, the chanting of the Hare Krishna Mahamantra. Golokera, Plaimadana Harinam Shankirtan, Ratin Jan Milo Kena Upai. I was traveling in Germany, came to one temple, stayed there for a while, it was my first time to the temple. And a very nice devotee who was running the temple, temple president, his name was Golokadam. And uh, he called me into his office one day and he wanted, he had a problem. He wanted some advice. He said, Maharaj, I don't know what to do in this situation. I have this wonderful pujari. She comes and she loves to dress the deities. She's always on time. She dresses the deities in the most beautiful way. She is eager to do her service, and everything about her service is excellent, but she doesn't chant Hare Krishna. So I'm trying to encourage her to chant Hare Krishna, but she says that, it's explained that there are nine processes of bhakti, shravanam, kirtanam, vishnu, smaranam, padasavitam, archanam, vandana, dasya, atmani, vedanam. And she says, therefore, and it mentions that all of the processes are equal. And if one of takes up any one of the processes, one can reach perfection. So I just want to do deity worship, that's all. <laughs> so what should I tell her? Well, then I remembered that verse in the Srimad Bhagavatam where Pallad Maharaj glorifies these nine processes. And then this purport is the longest purport in the Bhagavatam. It's about 12 pages long. In Srimad Bhagavatam, 7th Canto, 5th chapter, verses 22 and 23. And in that uh, explanation, Prabhupada goes into an extensive explanation on each one of the nine processes. But he definitely makes one particular point to prelude all of the other explanations, and that is that even if one takes up any of the other eight processes, one must chant the Hare Krishna Mahamantra. Because in this age, it's the Yuga Dharma. It is the means for self-realization in this age. And one who is seriously wants to make advancement in Krishna consciousness, to go back home, back to Godhead, must include and must place the chanting of the Hare Krishna Mahamantra foremost in their practice. 
And that's, that's been rep repeatedly said throughout the scriptures and by the Acharyas. So this was the prime. He had a very nice Pajari and she, she was doing her service excellently, um, but she wasn't gonna chant. And he said, I tried everything to get her to chant, so what should I do? I said, well, don't force her because eventually if she doesn't chant, she won't stay fixed in her service. And after that, she will give up her service. So he decided to let her continue. She wasn't chanting any japa, nothing. And uh, she was doing her service. And then after I had left that place, and after I came back about three months later, I said, how's that Pujari doing? He said, she's gone. She, she gave up her service and left. Because Krishna is in the heart, and Krishna is saying, you want to worship me in my deity form, but my, I have come also to show you the, the essence of the worship in this age. So you must, if you want to practice devotion to me, you must chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. And so therefore, when she didn't change, Krishna removed her from the service. Nobody else said anything to her. So there was an essence an example on how important it is to chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. Many of us may be expert in, in doing other services, such as deity worship or cooking or, or arranging material things for the temple to expand, preaching. But one has to chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra because this is what will purify the heart. The heart becomes purified, the mind becomes clear when one chants the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. And all problems are solved. What is the problem? Lack of Krishna consciousness. That's all. That's the only problem. <laughs> this statement was made by Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. I was talking to one of my senior god brothers who really likes to chant. He emphasizes chanting. So he's also a yatra leader. He's also a spiritual master. His name was Naranjan Swami. He preaches in Ukraine and Russia quite frequently. Well, this was many years ago. He said, he said, I was getting so many problems from the devotees. Every day, many devotees were coming one after another. I have this problem. I have that problem. Can you help me with this problem? I need, un I need some understanding of this situation. So he said it was quite voluminous. There was many, many people coming. So he was thinking what to do. He said, then he decided, he said, I'm gonna give every class for the next year only on the holy name. I'm only gonna speak about the holy name every class for one year. <laughs> And he did. He he spoke only at the holy name, and he stayed in that one place for one year. And then he later on he told me he said fifty percent of the problems were gone. <laughs> yeah. This is a this is a a prime example, a living example of how when we seriously take shelter of Krishna's holy name. Uh, it, it just clears the whole atmosphere, it purifies everything. And Krishna's name is Krishna. In the Srimad Bhagavatam, we have the, the statement by Sukadev Goswami to Maharaj Prikshit. When he's preaching about the glories of devotional service, he gets to the essence. He says, Kalir dosha nidhi rajan. Asti Echo Mahagun, Kirtana Eva Krishna's Ya, Mukta Sangam Param Bajet. Uh, that this age of Kali is clear, dosha nidi, nidi means ocean. It's an ocean of faults. There are so many problems. And Kali Yuga, if you read the scriptures, especially the 12th canto and also parts of the 11th canto, Bhagavatam, 
you'll find Kali Yuga is only going to increase. The, the problems of Kali Yuga will continue to be more and more and more. And everyone is affected by it, no matter who you are or where you are. Kali Yuga is, is poison, is going everywhere. And sometimes I was, somebody was talking to me yesterday explaining why a certain situation is the way it is. And I said, it's because it's Kali Yuga. Can't, you can't blame a particular mentality. I just, you just understand it's called, because it's Kali Yuga, there are so many deficiencies. What is that verse from the first canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam? Um, Sabda Kali, what is it? What? Hmm? The Galodas mean Yuge Janaha, Manda Sumanda Matiyo, Manya Bhaga Upagutaha. Kalir Dosh, no, no, that's not it. What's the first one? Prayena Prayasa, Sabda, Kalo Yuge Jisman Janaha. Manda Sumanda Matiyo, Manya Bhaga Padutaha. This verse establishes the mentality of the age of Kali. And people are unlucky, misguided, always disturbed, quarrelsome, and have so many problems. <laughs> <laughs> so many. This is the age of. <laughs> Cully. <laughs> I didn't know I could expand myself. <laughs> it just happened automatically. <laughs> it's the only mystic power I could possibly develop. <laughs> I'll tell you a story. It's from the Shrima, it's from the Mahabharata, and it illustrates something essential about this age of Kali and the glorification of the Lord. It's a long story, so please take, take some time to stay attentive. I heard this story from one great senior devotee who gave this, class, who gave this class in Mayapur. And his, he explained that after the battle of Kurukshetra, now the Pandavas had taken the throne and Yudhishthira had become the emperor of the world. And being a righteous and noble and Krishna conscious emperor, he was always thinking of the welfare of the progeny, his citizens. So one of the things he immediately established was that anyone from any part of the kingdom could come and speak to me about anything they wanted to talk about, whether it's a problem or anything. In other words, he focused his rule on just dealing with the citizens directly. He wanted, he was like a father who was com completely concerned for all of his children. So um, he's there in his office, and he made Bhima the secretary to, to be at the door, the warrior Bhima. So the first man comes, and he says, oh, Bhima, I have to see you this there. I have a problem. And Bhima said, well, you know, I think he's busy right now, but maybe you can tell me the problem. OK, so, well. I decided to make this nice garden, beautiful, beautiful garden. So I, I, I arranged all nice flowers and plants and shrubbery, trees and everything. I wanted to make a beautiful garden. And it took me a long time and I made this really first class garden. And after I was finished, I was so satisfied. But then I thought, I got to do something to protect the garden. So I decided, let me build a wall around the garden. So I did. I built this nice wall all around the garden. And then right after I finished the wall, the wall started to encroach upon the garden and destroy the garden. I built the wall to protect the garden, and now the, gar the wall is destroying the garden. So what's the answer? Bhima said, I think you should go see Yudhisthira. Okay. 
And so the second man comes and he, he walks, he says, can I uh, talk to you just there? I have, it's not a real big problem, but I still need an explanation. Abima said, I think he's busy right now. Why don't you speak with me? He said, okay. He said, I had this big bucket of water and I decided to empty the water into other containers. So I filled five containers, smaller containers completely, and then all the water was gone from the big bucket. Then I decided to take the containers and pour it back into the big bucket. And when I did, the, bu the bucket was only half filled. I started with a full bucket, filled five containers, put it back, and now the bucket's half filled. I didn't spill any. What happened? Bhima said, I think you should go see Yudhisthira. <laughs> Third man comes. He said, oh, Bhima, I saw something I can't believe. It's unbelievable. Yudhisthira, only he can give the explanations. Can I see him? Well, Bhima said, you know, give me a try. I think he's uh, busy. Okay. So he said, there was this elephant, huge elephant. And he was just walking and walking and walking. And he came right to this big, big wall. And he kept walking right into the wall. He crashed right through the wall. The wall broke. And he got all the way through, but his tiny tail got stuck. You know, the tails of the elephants are tiny. Explanation. Bhima said, well, I think you should go see you. <laughs> and the fourth man comes. He said, Bhima, uh, I'll talk to you about this because I know Yudhisthira has so many, he's very busy. But I decided to uh, just go someplace I'd never been before. I just wanted to experience another place. So I decided, let me pick, I picked the direction, I'll walk in this direction. I just kept walking and walking and walking. And I was walking, and it was in the afternoon, and I was walking, 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 and finally it was, I was walking for hours. And then I was observing the places I had never been before. But finally, at one point, everything just changed, and everything became full of rocks. They were like rock formations everywhere, big rocks. And then there were big shadows in the environment. And then the place started to get dark. And then I looked around and I thought, where am I? And then I looked at every side and there was rocks all around me in all directions. And I looked down and I saw more rocks. It was just, and I was, I started to become fearful and it was getting darker and darker and darker. So I said, let me get out of here. So I started to go and I started to go fast. And as I was going, I wasn't getting anywhere. It was in the same place. Then I looked down and I saw this beautiful little green creeper growing out of the rocks. It was the only green thing in the area. So I just pulled it to see what it was. And as soon as I pulled it out, all the rocks disappeared, all the darkness cleared, the sun came out and everything was bright and I felt happy. What's the explanation? <laughs> I think you, go, you should go to see Yudhisthira. So after some time, Bhima, he decides to go in where Yudhisthira is and he says, oh Yudhisthira, did you see those four men? What four men? I didn't see. Oh, those four men. Oh, yes. They represent Kali Yuga. Krishna has disappeared from the planet, and now Kali Yuga is making its advent. Can you explain their stories, Bhima asks? Yes. The first man, the man with the garden, yes. The citizens will elect their leaders to rule the country, but the leaders will destroy the citizens. Kali Yuga. <laughs> Elect the politicians to take care of the people, but the politicians will destroy the people. Kali Yuga. Second one, what is the one with the buckets? 
Well, that's very sad. Mothers, superiors, guardians will take fathers will take time to take to take care of their children, give them as much as they can for their life, but the children will not appreciate their parents. You start with a full bucket, you give, and you only get half back. <laughs> Children will not appreciate their parents. Kali Yuga. What is the one with the elephant and the wall and the tail? Yes, Yudhisthira says, if you have money, you get justice. If you, have, if you don't have money, no justice. The rich man, he can go anywhere and everywhere. He can buy justice. But the poor man, the little tail, he gets stuck. Even if he's innocent because he has no money, he can't defend himself, Kali Yuga. And these three stories, when you think about it and you look around, they are actually everywhere, practically everywhere in the world. And then Yudhisthira, and then Bhima asked, well, what about this last man? He said, Yudhisthira said, that's, that's, that's good. He said, that green creeper he pulled out of the ground, that's the holy name. Kaler doshanidi rajan asti eko mahagun kirtanaya vikrishna syak mukta sangam varambi. That of all of the darkness in the, this age, there's a light that is so bright, <laughs> so bright that it can destroy all levels of darkness and anywhere. And that is the chanting of Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, 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 Hare Hare. So Krishna's name is Krishna. Uh, it's mentioned that in the that there's no difference. Kali, Kali what is it? Kali Kalair, Nama Rupa Krishna Avatar, Nama Hoite Hayasarva Jagat Nistara. In this age of Kali, Krishna has come in the form of his name. His name is him. It is non-different. There was one sannyasi, he was giving a class one time, very senior sannyasi in our movement. And Srila Prabhupada was there. He wanted to listen to his uh, disciple give class. Prabhupada was sitting, can you imagine giving class with Prabhupada sitting there listening to him? I would kind of hide behind the walls and he'd shrink into the seat. You know. But this, this sannyasi was giving a class, and at one point he said, and Krishna is in his name. And Prabhupada stopped him and said, where in his name is he? <laughs> and then he got the message. Oh, yes, Krishna is not in his name. He is his name. <laughs> it's not he, he's, you have to look through the name to find him. The name is him. The sound vibration of that, of the name Krishna is non-different than Krishna himself. And that's impossible to analyze. You can't apply logic to that. It doesn't work with any kind of rational or even imaginary types of analysis. It can only be understood by experience. That's all. Krishna's name is Krishna. So we see here, and Ajamil, he, he, he chanted Nama Bas. All of the reactions of all his sinful activities he had committed, not only from that life, from previous lives, were completely destroyed simply by chanting the holy name of Narayan. And it says that the holy name of Krishna contains the absolute supreme energies of the Lord. Narayan is 96% of the absolute qualities. And Krishna is, is the, the full uh, principle of the sunam bonum of the absolute truth. And just by chanting Narayan's name, but he remembered Narayan. He remembered Narayan when he chanted. And that was the point. Although he was calling his son, thinking about his son, he called with such desperation in a helpless condition that when he heard his own voice 
chant the name of Narayan, he remembered the personality of Narayan. And because he did that, everything was, uh, all the reactions. He didn't get pure devotional service, but he got freedom from all sinful actions. And as it explains in the previous verses, he had to go to Hardwar in the Himalayas and spend 12 years there, finish out his bhakti, and ultimately he reached the stage of pure devotional service. And he went back home, back to Godhead. So here's the, you can see the mercy of the Lord's name. But we can't use the, the name for anything material. The Lord, sometimes devotees like to improve their material life by chanting Hare Krishna or by getting some, some material benefit from that or by destroying their enemy by chanting Hare Krishna. That's chanting in the mode of ignorance. If you're chanting in a mode of ignorance, it's, it's about destroying your enemy. If it's, if, even if you don't have an enemy, you think of one. <laughs> and if you're in the mode of passion chanting, you're trying to get some material gain. If you're chanting in the mode of goodness, you're trying to elevate yourself to the platform of uh, uh, transcendental knowledge. But if you're chanting in the mode of uh, suddhasattva, pure goodness, which is a development, that takes some time to develop. It's not that this doesn't come so easy. That chanting attracts Krishna personally, and Krishna actually comes to associate with his devotee in, this, in the name. Because Krishna, he's, he's seeing how we are chanting, whether we're chanting for some material gain or whether we're chanting simply to get some nectar, where you think, I can squeeze that name and get all the juice from it, and it's, it's better than mango juice. I mean, so sweet. But that's another form of what we say. It's not, it's not pure chanting if we're trying to get something from the name. Chant to please Krishna. Chant to associate with Krishna. Chant to call out Krishna. Krishna save me. Ainanda tanuja kinkaram bhaktidam mam vishyame bhavam buddha. Vipaya tavapara pankajam stita duli sadrisham vichinta. O oh, son of Maharaj Nanda Krishna, I am your eternal servant. Somehow I've fallen into this ocean of birth and death. This material world is like a gigantic ocean. When we're singing the Guru prayers, um, what is it? Chi Guru Charana Padma Kevala Bhakati Sadma Bando Muhi Sarva Dhanamate Yanhara Prasade Bhai E Bhava Tariyarai. That line says that the spiritual master takes you across the ocean of material suffering and Krishna Prapti Hoi Mate, he delivers you to the lotus feet of Krishna. So that is the process that if we, we can please the Lord and please the spiritual master by our efforts in devotional service. And here it mentions that the essence of devotional service all, abs all activities of devotional service are absolute, but emphasis is given on hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord. Parikshit Maharaj was listening to Sukadev Goswami for six full days. And after six days, Sukadev Goswami said, Maharaj, you want to uh, take a break, get a little rest, have a little water? He said, no, this is the best part. Please continue because Sukadeva Goswami had stopped after nine cantos, and he was about to begin the 10th canto, and, and Maharaj Pariksha was so enthusiastic. He said, here, I want to hear the glories of the Lord in Sri Vrindavan. And after he heard, not only that, but even farther, the discussion between uh, Krishna and and Uddhava, from the 11th canto, he, was, he had completely become purified. And then Maharaj, then Sukadev Goswami told him about the horrors of material life in the age of Kali. After he heard about all of the anomalies and that, he was completely free from any fear of losing his material body. He had reached the stage of pure 
fixed, his consciousness was fixed. He wasn't going to be disturbed by anything happening in the material world. And then he sat down, after hearing from Sukadeva Goswami, he offered his obeisances and offered beautiful prayers, glorifying Sukadeva Goswami. And then he went to a holy place and sat in meditation. When he sat in meditation, then it was time for that snake bird, to Toxica, to come and bite. So he was on his way, but Kashapa Muni stopped him and said, you're not going to do it. You're not going to kill uh, Maharaj Pariksit because I have... I have the power to destroy all poison on all levels. So to Toxica said to Kashapa, my poison is so powerful, no one can annihilate it, dilute it, remove it. Kashapa Muni said, test me. <laughs> so Toxica saw this tree and he shot his poison at the tree. The tree burned to down to ashes. Kashapa used his power and brought the tree back. <laughs> Toxica realized, if Kashapa Muni is here, I can't do my mission. <laughs> so then he bribed Kashapa with a lot of money. <laughs> and then what he did, he took a disguise as a brahmana. He covered himself. And then he went to the area of Maharaj Pariksit. And when no one was looking, he lost his Brahm Brahminical covering. And then he bit the foot of uh, Maharaj Pariksit. And at that time, the body of Maharaj Par Pariksit just burst into flames. But Maharaj Pariksit was completely oblivious or completely transcendental to what was happening. Everyone was shocked. When the word got back to the son of Maharaj Pariksit, Janmin Jaya, who was King Janmin Jaya, he became so angry that he decided to perform a yagya to destroy all the snakes in the world. And so he called the Brahmins. He was powerful. And the Brahmins performed this yagya, and all of the snakes were flying from different places in the world and falling into this fire and being destroyed. But Toxica realized that he's a, he was feeling himself being pulled into that fire, so he decided to take shelter of Indra. <laughs> so he went to Indra and said, give me shelter, Indra. Indra said, yes, I will. So Indra brought Toxica in his airplane and gave him shelter. When John Manjaya found out, he told the Brahmins, now let's bring Indra, Toxica, and all the devas into the fire. <laughs> Oh, he was really determined. <laughs> so the Brahmins then performed another yagya to bring Indra in, <laughs> along with his airplane, Toxica, and the, all the devatas. Uh, Janman Jaya was really angry that his son had been killed. So uh, then Indra's flying along with his airplane, his airplane shaking, <laughs> and he's, he's, what's going on here? So then he starts uh, uh, offering prayers, and Brihaspati comes and says, it's John Minjaya, he's doing it, I'll, I'll talk to him. <laughs> so he went over to John Minjaya and told him, you know, you can't punish all the snakes for one snake, <laughs> so stop your yogya. And, uh, and he pleaded with him in a very, and because Brihaspati was a very powerful personality and a great sadhu, Janman Jaya agreed to stop the yagya. <laughs> so this is a little bit about what happened after Maharaj Pariksit reached it. So, but the point is that he was completely free from even the slightest amount of fear. In this age of Kali, there are so many reasons why fear can appear in a person's life. And material life is based on fear. In fact, fear is a principle that is used by the materialist in order to get people to do things and to buy things. Now, fear is a, is, a, is a propaganda that is used to sell products to 
to put forth your own ideas at the, at the expense of others. So fear is, fear is the, one of the worst uh, negative qualities. And those who are free from fear, they're happy. But can we be completely free from fear? Can one be completely free from fear? What is the worst kind of fear? Death. Death. Shakespeare, the, the great Shakespeare said, there's the rub. <laughs> there's the problem, death. But even one can be free from death. Prabhupada says, birth, death, disease, and old age is built in, into the material world. Anyone who has a material body must undergo these four tribulations. But for one who comes to the transcendental platform, and one can actually free, be free from all fear, even the fear of death. And then when one leaves the body, that is the last time they die. They don't die. They actually just go from one place to another. Death is for a devotee is the, is the gateway to eternal life. It's the gateway to eternal life. It brings one to their constitutional position as the eternal servant of the Lord in the spiritual world. So, but, but the way the material energy is constituted, we find that fear is there everywhere. Fear of not getting, fear of losing, fear of not enjoying what you achieve. Fear is everyone. So one who seriously and, seriously and regularly chants the holy names of the Lord, one can be free from the element of fear. And if one is fearless, then they are, they are on the, they're pretty much on the, sp the spiritual platform because fear only exists on the material platform, but it's very strong. So chant the holy names of the Lord, associate with devotees, and understand that the, 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 the material body you have is a gift by the Lord so you can get out of this material world. It's not meant to be used to enjoy the things of this world which are not enjoyable. It's simply an opportunity to get out of the material world. And sometimes we take it for granted that there's so many human beings and I have, I'm a human being, I have a human body and so many. But actually in proportion to the amount of living entities in existence, the human form of life is so rare. It's so small in proportion. All of the other species of life are so much greater in number than the human, li human form of life. So to get a human form of life and to be born in the land of India, Bhartvarsya, is a special, special mercy. It says that in the fifth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, those who were born in India, that means that they, uh, this, this should be their last birth in this material world. You've come, you've come to the stage of having gone through all of the other millions of births and have taken birth in maybe other human forms and now you actually have reached the stage where it becomes easy and natural to practice devotional service because the environment and the culture is suited for spiritual practice. As Prabhupada says that Krishna appeared so many places in the world but mostly in India. <laughs> I, uh, should I tell you a joke? Yeah. It's not a joke, it's a truism. One Indian sadhu, he, um, he's traveling around. And, no, he's not traveling. Yeah, he's, he's traveling around. He's thinking, where can I go? He's just left India. And he has his little ashram, but he wants to experience the West. So where can I go? And, oh, okay, I'll go to Rome. Rome, and because they have the Vatican, so it's it's very pious there. It's very religious. So he's in Rome, so he's walking around. After some time, he meets a bishop. The bishop is one of these leaders in the Catholicism in the Christian tradition. So he becomes friends with this bishop. The bishop invites him into his office. They're sitting there. They're talking, and then the yogi. 
he looks and he sees on the desk of a bishop, there's this very usual, unusual looking phone. And he says to the bishop, wow, that's an unusual phone. Never saw one like that before. Is that a special phone? The bishop says, yeah, we use it for calling God. Really? We can call God on that? Yeah. Can we call God? Let's do it. Okay, so they sit down and Bishop dials God's phone number. God gets on the line and, and uh, they're, they're having conversation with the Supreme Lord. And the bishop's talking. Yogi says, can I talk? Yeah. So he gives him the phone. He talks to God. They both have a nice conversation with God. The Yogi said, wow, that was really wonderful. But I, then I, the Yogi started to think, hmm, hmm. Boy, that must have been an expensive call. And he asked the bishop, he said, how much was that? He said, yeah, it was quite expensive. It was 400 euros for that call. So the yogi said, well, actually, I have extra, some extra travel money. Can I help pay for it? No, that's all right. You're my guest. So I don't even have to worry. So after some time, the yogi leaves the area, and he goes back to India, and he's got he's back in his ashram. And that same bishop, he now he wants to travel. He remembers he has a yogi friend in India, so he, he has his card. He goes to the yogi's ashram. And they're sitting there talking and are having a nice conversation, renewing their friendship. And then all of a sudden, the, the bishop looks, he says, hey, you got a phone like mine. Just like it. Is that for calling God? He said, yeah, I thought I'd get one too. <laughs> okay, so... Can we call God? Yeah. So the yogi calls God, dials his number, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, 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 Hare. Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram, Ram. God gets on the line, says, I was just what locks me. What do you want? Okay. <laughs> I just added that to the joke. <laughs> so uh, they're talking to God and they're both talking. Finally, the conversation ends. And the bishop remembers that the yogi offered to pay for the call. So he said, well, you know, can I help pay for the call? The yogi said, no, nah, that's all right. He said, how much was that call? He said, it was two rupees. He said, yeah, in India, it's a local call. <laughs> you get the point. <laughs> so don't go, go, don't go to the West looking for something better. <laughs> it's all right here. <laughs> Bhakti Siddhanta says, Indians leave, Indians leave India for two reasons. One, to preach. Two, for sense gratification. <laughs> so if you want to leave, go to preach. <laughs> but that's the only reason. Krishna is here in so many different ways and the environment is conducive for Krishna consciousness. And so we want to use this life not, not to waste time, go back home, back to Godhead, because that is the purpose of human life. And having uh, the privilege of being born in, in this culture, in this tradition, is a great, great benediction. It's quite rare to get this particular birth. So that rarity means that you can solve all problems of human life and go back home, back to Godhead. Okay, I'll stop here. Any questions or comments? Okay, do we, do we have a microphone somewhere? This right behind me, yeah. And then you're, you can go next. <laughs> Hare Krishna Maharaj, Thandavad Pranam. Maharaj, how to chant in such a way that uh, Lord Sachinanda and Lord Nithai are pleased? How can we chant in such a way that when you realize that you're helpless, if you think you can do things, if you think you're okay, you can't chant feelingly. When you, when you realize without the mercy of the Lord, Without the, without the, yeah, without the mercy of the Lord in your life, you can't do anything. You're helpless. 
this material world is adhyatmika, adhibhautika, adhidasika, adhidaivika, four miseries of the material world. And in those miseries, we're always being challenged, miseries of the body and mind, miseries of other living beings, miseries of higher powers, miseries are coming. We're helpless. These miseries are more powerful than us. How can we somehow or other stay, what we say, sane in this material? We need to call out to Krishna, my dear Lord, I'm suffering in this material world. I'm not only suffering because it's so miserable here, but I'm suffering because I'm without you. That's the real suffering. That somehow we left Krishna and we think we can somehow or other make a nice arrangement separate. So we're in a very difficult situation. Padam, padam, ya vi padam. At any moment, this material world, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati used to say all the time, material world is no place for a gentleman, no place for a gentle lady. In other words, anyone who has any intelligence can understand. I'm in this, I, I'm suffering. And I'm, I'm without you and material energy. At any time, one can die. There's so many stories how death comes all of a sudden, unexpectedly to the most uh, unlikely place or unlikely person. It's a very dangerous place. So one should chant with feeling that, please pick me up. Ayinanda tenuja kinka. Pick me up and place me as one of the atoms at your lotus feet. So we have to chant in that mood of helplessness, calling out for Krishna's mercy. That's, that's the mood of chanting. And chant with attention also. Okay, thank you. Question here? So we have a, somehow it went over there. <laughs> Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, you mentioned that uh, the name Narayan is 96% uh, of the full potency. So in case of Ajamil, he chanted the name of Narayan and the Vishnu Dutas came and rescued him. So what would have happened in, if uh, Ajamil would have chanted the name of Krishna instead of Narayan? He wants me to speculate. <laughs> Is this mental speculation or philosophical speculation? You can ask Krishna and see what he says. <laughs> well, Taking your question very seriously, <laughs> if he chanted in that same mood of helplessness, the, the scriptures say that one's purely chanting Krishna, and then everything, you know, one can be transferred immediately to the spiritual world. But the point is that even if he chanted purely the name of Krishna, the same thing would have happened. All of the reactions of all his sinful activities would have been God. And he would have been experiencing transcendental happiness, no doubt. Whether he would have been immediately went back to Godhead, it's really, it's not something that I could speculate on. But you could say that it would be, he would be in a better position if he chanted the holy names of Krishna. But he named his son Narayan. He named his son Narayan. So we do that in our families. We name the children after names of the Lord. But then again, you have to be careful when you chastise your kid. Hey, Krishna, what are you doing? <laughs> hey, Narayan, don't do that. <laughs> so, so when you're, you have to be careful when you... 
name your kids after the supreme personality of God. <laughs> you, when you call them, you, you can't chastise. If you chastise, you better not use their names. <laughs> So that's, uh, 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 mothers and fathers understand that. <laughs> so. But all I can say is probably he would have been better off. Because, um, that's what I would say. How that better off was understood, we don't really know. <laughs> That's what that's that's my philosophical speculation. Yeah. Pranam Maharaj. Maharaj, in the purport, uh, Shila Prabhupada speaks about impersonalists getting attached to uh, mundane welfare works, uh, and then we see in in our society, uh, on one level, we are preaching about pure devotional service, and on the other hand, we also have uh, uh, many welfare activities like uh, midday meals and food for life and hospitals. So how is our welfare activity different from that of impersonalists? How is our? Welfare activities that we do in ISKCON different from that of impersonalists? It's, it's bhakti. It's not, they're doing it. Aruna Krishna, Padam Padam Padantiyada. They fall down from their platform of whatever they achieve through karma, yoga, jnana, or yoga. They fall down and they fall back into the material world. They may still be in the, somewhat in the mode of goodness, but they take up these adventures simply as some philanthropical work. We don't do any of these food for life or even hospitals. We don't do it as a philanthropical. We do it as a service to the living entities. And we're not trying to profit from these things. So many of these yogis, they usually, they open some business or get involved in some kind of politics and then they start, you know, getting material benefits from that. Because uh, now they're back in the material world again. And so, uh, so they're again trying to get something from material activities. We're not trying to, we're not, we don't perform these activities simply to gain something. We do it as a service. So it's bhakti. Yeah, so, yeah, back there in the, uh, that brahmachari back there, yeah. Hi Krishna, thank you Maharaj. My question is about um, if we had seven days to live, just like Maharaj Pariksit had seven days to live, would we? Would you recommend the same prescription that he took? Uh, now hearing, that we're hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord, that prescription that was given is actually a standard for all of us to understand. Yeah. To simply desist from all other activities and just absorb yourself in Krishna. Hearing his name, chanting his name, or chanting his glories. Because by absorbing one's consciousness of that, one becomes purified automatically, and gradually one becomes more and more fixed on the transcendental platform. Yeah. So is it individual, which type of absorption we want, like Sankirtan or, or Harinams or hearing Shrimad Bhagavatam, is it individual? Or is it? it? It depends on the person, I think, or in the situation. I think what we see in our Krishna consciousness society is when devotees are in that stage, they're about to leave. Devotees come and, and chant with them and read to them. So we do that. There are many, that's usually the protocol we follow. Devotees sing, go around that dying person and just chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantras. I remember I was with one very elevated personality who was dying in Mayapur. And uh, it was a lady and she was, she was fixed in her Krishna consciousness. She was from the West. So I came to see her, and of course, going to see her meant you had to read. 
you just couldn't go there and just talk. And so everyone who came was reading Bhagavatam to her. And then I started to read, and they gave me a really nice section of the 10th canto to read. And then I was reading to her, and she was becoming absorbed. I mean, she was, she completely lost all external consciousness. And I was completely oblivious to whatever was going on around me. The energy was so spiritual that and when I left there, I was, I was dancing down the street. <laughs> I, was, I was like joyful. <laughs> I was just joyful, just reading to this person who was so absorbed and that not only was she getting some benefits from hearing, but I was getting a more benefit from reading. So yeah, you purify everybody by that, 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 that sangha. A coming uh, person's leaving the body, just chant and, and, hear, and read, read, read the 10th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, Krishna's pastimes in Vrindavan. Prepares the soul for their you know, final destination. Yeah. Thank you. Buddy Shamprabhu, want to say something? Okay. Yeah. You haven't used up your quota yet. You haven't used your quota yet. Okay. You still have some, some, some quota left. Thank you, Maharaj, for such a very profound class. Uh, when I heard the stories of Niranjan Maharaj and this real stories of ISKCON, it was very inspiring as well as the other story was creating a lot of confusion. The other story of Pujari. So, but anyway, I don't want to ask anything about it. Uh, what I want to ask is, uh, that when I hear about Devananda Pandit and uh, uh, Rupa Narayan, who were very profound speakers <coughs> of Bhagavatam, and yeah. when I hear about Ramdas Vishwas, who was chanting constantly and serving Raghunath Bhatta Goswami all the time, and there are 13 Sampradayas, mm -hmm. they also chant the holy name. So, if these things are so potent, then why it didn't work on these people? Is it that it's very difficult to do it properly? So, why didn't it work on? Ramdas Vishwas or the Appa Sampradayas are also chanting Hare Krishna. It, and the people no, was reciting was, Bhagavad. He was chanting Ram's name. He was, uh, he was chanting Ram's name. Ram Vishwasu? He was chanting Ram's name, right? Because he wanted to become Ram. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's obvious. You can't become Ram. <laughs> Ram's Ram. The position's taken. Mm -hmm. So uh, why wasn't he getting, obviously he was getting some benefit, but he was chanting as a, with offense, because he was trying to become God. You can't chant to become God, that's offensive. <laughs> His motivation was material. It's impossible to become God. God is God. So he was chanting with offense. Yes, madam, that is very clear that there is offense. Uh, but if holy name and holy fame are so potent, then why didn't it work on Devanand Pandit, even on the Rup Kaviraj and here? Devanand Pandit offended Srivas Thakur. The Lord became angry with Devanand Pandit and told him that you, your reading of Bhagavatam is useless. He told him that. But when he was reading Bhagavatam, Srivas Thakur actually became absorbed in hearing Krishna's pastimes from Devananda Pandit. So he had some shakti, 
no question about that, because he had followers also. But he was making a, you know, a show out of it. There's people even today who they recite the whole Ramayan or they recite some part of the Vedas as a way to attract followers, as a way to get some material remuneration, or just to become popular. So that's, uh, that's chanting with offense. And when you chant with offense, you get hardly any benefit from that chanting. The, we tell people like that, give up the offensive mentality and keep chanting and then you'll, you'll get the benefit. But if they continue with that wrong mentality, then after some time, even Lord Chaitanya spoke strongly that anyone who, who offends a Vaishnava and is chanting the holy names of the Lord, that chanting destroys that, that person. He says that in Chaitanya Charitamrita, it's mentioned. So one has to chant with a mood of trying to reduce and eliminate the fences. That has to be there also. One cannot continue to chant and continue to, con to commit offenses and expect that, that chanting will give you some benefit. Because mm -hmm. Krishna's name is Krishna. It can't be used for something material or as a way to, you know, propagate one's own selfish interests. Or you can't chant Krishna's name to become Krishna. It doesn't work. We chant to please Krishna, we chant to purify our heart. That's the reason why we chant. That's the only reason. Other reasons are just nama parad. We have another question, yeah. How long should we keep the class going? I can ask questions. It's already 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock we quit? Okay. Yeah. They say you cannot live by philosophy alone. <laughs> Take Prashad. <laughs> you need Prashad too. <laughs> well, give him, let him ask his question. He has one, one more question. Last question. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. Thank you so much, Maharaj, for this amazing lecture. Maharaj, we Personally, I feel in my life that whenever I have to face some austerities in bhakti, I start anal analyzing, should I really go for it? Is it really worth it uh, just to please Krishna? But Maharaj, I was once hearing in a lecture of His Holiness mm -hmm. Radhanath Maharaj, in which Maharaj, Maharaj was sharing about his days in New Vrindavan when you were also there. So there were so many austerities that you had performed there. It was so bitter cold and there were no heaters, there were, there were not even proper clothings. And once even the temple was attacked by decoits and many devotees were injured and still when so many devotees were leaving from there, you became, and along with His Holiness Radhanath Maharaj, you became inspiration for others. So Maharaj, how will we ever be able to develop a drop of that faith that you and Maharaj have and oh. when will ever be possible for well, us? Well, those austerities, we didn't, they were forced upon us. We, we <laughs> It's not like, well, some devotees left because of the austerities, that's true, but those, the ones who stayed were the ones who made advancement, but we didn't ask for those things, they just came by way of providence, you know. So, but we understood that, okay, even though it's difficult, even though we don't, uh, we're, go, we're going through this, this difficulty, Still, Krishna consciousness is so nice. We didn't want to leave. 
we had some, there was some taste, there was some faith. The faith was there. That we, despite all the difficulties, I'm not going to give up Krishna consciousness or not going to give up my service. That was it. We had that faith. And that faith comes by, you know, associating with devotees and getting a taste. There was some taste there. The taste had already been there. Maharaj, what's the process of attaining a little bit of that faith? Because had I been there in New Vrindavan, I would have for sure left. Well, sometimes they say that if you want that faith, associate with people who have it. And by associating with such persons, it, it becomes, you, you start, it's like when you associate with a diseased person, you can get diseased. <laughs> You associate with a person who knows how to make money, then you also become like that. So, if you associate with a person who is, uh, who you know, is fixed in Krishna consciousness, is not going to be going this way or that way because of difficulty, then you also start developing those characteristics. You observe and you also practice. But if you understand, it's for your benefit. Difficulties are opportunities for advancement because they purify the heart, they detach you from something material, and they help us to remember Krishna. And that's the most important thing. Difficulties will force us to remember Krishna. We think, oh, where, where can I go? Just take shelter of Krishna. I'll tell you a story about... It's a... And this is a very interesting little pastime, and then we can end. It happened up almost a year ago, maybe eight months ago. <clears throat> Last year, maybe in the beginning of uh, 2021, we were, we were preaching in jail. So there was one young man who was in jail, and he had just connected with the devotees. And he was reading our books. He was chanting. And then practically the whole jail came down with coronavirus. And the, jail, the jailers, the authorities there, weren't going to do anything to help the inmates who were sick. They didn't give him any medicine, any care, nothing. So he, he was quite sick. And he was feeling, I'm going to die any minute. So he just went into his own little area, cell, and he just chanted. That's all he did. He just chanted, 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 and kept chanting, chanting and praying. And after a few days, he was completely cured. The disease was gone completely. He, by the, having faith in Krishna and the holy name, the, the holy name cured, cured him. He was, uh, he, was, he was thinking, I'm on the verge of death. I'm just going to take shelter of Krishna and, and chant and chant and chant and pray and pray and pray. And he did. And Krishna saved him. So that's the power of the holy name. But that's the power of faith also. He didn't try anything else. He just, just went for Krishna. That's all. Complete faith that there's no other place to go but Krishna. So when you find yourself in any situation, you should understand that that is the, that is the means for uh, getting the strength to deal with the situation or getting free from the situation, both. Sometimes Krishna will force us into a situation that's difficult just so we can, be, we can become more attached to him or free us from some material attachment. And sometimes when we take shelter of Krishna in difficult situations, the, the difficult situation is removed. Either way, you either get the strength to deal with it or it's removed. You can't lose. Don't be afraid of difficulties. <laughs> they come all the time. I was just mentioning, I mentioned before, you didn't hear me, I said there's four material miseries. You heard that, Adiyatmik, Adibautik, Adidaivaka, but then there's the fourth one, it's called Adidasaka. 
miseries of personal servants. <laughs> I get it everywhere I go. <laughs> I'd call Adi Dasika. So I get it all the time. But I still, I still like my personal servants because <laughs> they, they help me. <laughs> we have to travel and preach. Traveling is difficult, but we do it because we have to do our service, right? We can't say, oh, because traveling is difficult, I I'm not going to do my service. No, we do it. Because, you know, so you, there's, there's some, some difficulties, austerities that you... Sometimes you're with, you have to live with someone or be with someone and you just don't get along or your personalities are, are you know, opposite. But sometimes, sometimes you have to just do that and somehow work and become Krishna conscious in that atmosphere. It's just the way it is. The materialists are always waiting for life to work according to their plan. That's their whole idea. Sooner or later, Life will work according to my plan. That's how they think. But devotees know that's just a dream. <laughs> the life works according to the way Mother Nature works according to Krishna's plan, <laughs> not according to our plan. So therefore, you have to understand there's always, there's always reverses, there's always difficulties. But these things are good because they 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 call they call you they force you to call out for Krishna. They force you to remember Krishna. Thank you. See you.